Hello and welcome to Fluid Mechanics. My name is Dr. Mark Taylor, lecturer in civil engineering. So this is unit six. And in this unit, we're going to look at flow in pipes. So this is unit six of 10. And in this unit, we're going to look at friction and head loss. And in the tutorial questions, we're going to look at parallel and branching pipes and some of the calculations associated with these subjects. So the aims of this lesson are to provide an understanding of the importance of flows in single pipes the application and use of methods for describing flows in single pipes. And we're going to have a look at the darcy weisbach equation and its applications. And you're going to gain an appreciation of the frictional losses and fittings in pipe systems. We're going to understand what's meant by smooth and rough pipes. And we're going to look at the relationship between energy and the hydraulic gradient. So at the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain the relationship between energy losses and pipe diameter define and describe the use of the darcy weisbach equation, identify historical experiments which examine roughness, explain the concept of the hydraulic gradient, explain separation losses in pipe fittings, and demonstrate the use of the colebrook white equation. And finally, use hydraulic design charts. Pipes are a common feature in water supply systems and sewerage systems. They're enclosed usually circular in cross-section, and generally flow full of water. Water in pipes can flow uphill as well as downhill, so land topography does not present the same issues as open channels. There are occasions when pipes do not flow full, for example in gravity sewers. They behave like open channels. They are pipes as they're buried underground, as it's a bit difficult to bury an open channel. So we're going to start off by having a look at energy losses and the relationship with pipe size or diameter. The most common formula linking energy loss with pipe size for turbulent flow is devised by Julius Weisbach on the left and Henry Darcy on the right, and is often referred to as the Darcy Weisbach equation. Here you can see that H subscript F is equal to the friction factor multiplied by the length of the pipe multiplied by the velocity squared divided by two times gravity times the diameter of the pipe. And as a word of caution, American textbooks use the term F as a friction factor, and that's not the same as lambda. The relationship is lambda equals 4F. So the darcy weisbach equation shows that the energy loss depends upon the pipe length, the velocity of the liquid, the diameter of the pipe, and the friction between the pipe and the flow itself. In terms of length, this has a direct influence on energy loss. The longer the pipe, the greater the energy loss. The velocity has the greatest influence, as it is the square of the velocity that counts. E.g. the velocity doubles and the energy loss increases fourfold. So the usual practice is to keep velocity below 1.6 meters per second to avoid excessive energy losses. In terms of the pipe diameter, this has quite a dramatic effect on energy loss. As the pipe diameter is increased, the energy losses increase as a direct effect of the diameter, but also the influence on the velocity, remember that Q equals VA. To reduce the diameter by half increases the, the value of HF by 32. Pipe friction. It's not just a simple measure of pipe roughness. It depends on several factors that will be explored in the lecture. So let's consider a simple example. If we consider a pipe a thousand metres long with a flow of 0.1 cubic metres per second and a lambda value of 0 0.04, we can use the darcy weisbach equation to calculate the head loss. And you'll notice that there's a large rise in head loss as the pipe diameter is reduced. Clearly the choice of pipe diameter is a critical issue in the design of a pipeline. So some of the earliest work on pipe friction was undertaken by a German fluid dynamics physicist, Paul Richard Heinrich Blasius. He conducted experiments on different pipes and different flows and came to the conclusion that lambda depended upon the Reynolds number and not the roughness of the pipe. And he developed a formula shown here. However, Johann Nikorads, another German physicist and engineer, was somewhat puzzled by his results. He studied different pipe diameters with sand grains of known size to change the roughness of the inside of the pipe. He found 
that lambda depends on the roughness and not Reynolds number. Clearly either something was wrong or each was looking at something slightly different. So Blasius was examining flows with low Reynolds numbers and his results refer to what we now call smooth pipes. Likerad's experiments dealt with high Reynolds numbers and his results refer to what we now call rough pipes. The terms rough and smooth refer to the flow conditions. And for example, the same pipe may be described as rough and smooth. How the pipe feels to touch is not a guide of its smoothness in hydraulic terms. Pipes which are smooth to touch can still be very rough hydraulically. A pipe that feels rough to touch may be very rough hydraulically and high energy losses can be expected. So even when the flow is turbulent, there is a thin layer of fluid less than one millimetre close to the boundary that is laminar, and this is called the laminar sublayer. At low Reynolds numbers, the laminar sublayer is at its thickest and completely covers the roughness of the pipe. The main flow is therefore unaffected by the roughness of the pipe. The laminar sublayer covers the rough part of the pipe and protects the flow from the pipe wall. If you look at figure A, this is the smooth pipe flow that Blasius studied. As the Reynolds numbers increase, the laminar sublayer becomes thinner until the roughness elements of the pipe protrude into the main flow, and this is shown in figure B. The flow is now influenced by viscosity and pipe roughness. You can see this in the transition zone in figure B. As the Reynolds number increases further, the laminar sublayer all but disappears, and the roughness of the pipe wall dominates friction, and this is Nicarad's rough pipe scenario. So we're now going to examine what we mean by hydraulic gradient and total energy. So a way of showing energy losses in a pipeline is to show them as an energy hydraulic gradient figure, as shown below. The total energy line is drawn along the length of the pipe, and this is the line that's marked with the E's. It also slopes downwards and in the direction of flow, and demonstrates that energy is continually being lost due to friction. It connects the water surfaces on the two reservoirs in this case. So note the step at the lower reservoir is due to the energy loss at the outlet to the tank. The energy line is not always necessarily parallel to the pipeline as the pipe itself follows the topography of the route. The total energy in the pipe is of interest but the pressure is more important. A second line is drawn below the energy line parallel to represent the pressure or the pressure energy and this is marked with an H in the figure below. This shows the pressure change along the pipeline. Imagine piezometers along the pipeline. Water would rise up to this line to represent the pressure head. The difference between the two lines is the kinetic energy. The energy line and the hydraulic gradient are straight lines. The rate of energy loss and the pressure loss are uniform, i.e. the same rate. The slope of the pressure line is called the hydraulic gradient and is calculated as shown. The hydraulic gradient has no dimensions. We divide the length in metres by a head difference in metres. It's often expressed in metres head per metre length of pipeline. For example, a hydraulic gradient of 0 0.02 means that for every metre of pipeline there will be a pressure loss of 0 0.02 metres of head. The hydraulic gradient is not a fixed line for a pipe, it depends upon the flow, so no flow will be horizontal, in full flow it will be at its steepest gradient, as shown in the figure below. The energy gradient can only slope downwards in the direction of flow. Hydraulic gradient can slope upwards as well as downwards. Consider a pipe junction where water flows from a smaller pipe to a larger pipe. As water enters the larger pipe, the velocity reduces and so does the kinetic energy. There is some energy loss when the pipe expands, and most of the loss in kinetic energy is recovered as pressure head energy, and the pressure increases. So let's consider the two reservoirs again. The energy gradient starts at the water surface, and the hydraulic gradient starts below the water surface. The hydraulic gradient starts below as the kinetic energy increases as the water enters the pipe, so there is a corresponding drop in pressure. As the flow enters the second reservoir, 
the energy line is just above the water's surface. There is a small loss in energy as the flow expands from the pipe into the reservoir. The hydraulic gradient is below at the water level at the second reservoir because there is still some kinetic energy in the flow. When it enters the reservoir, it changes back to pressure energy. These losses are minimal in comparison with the pipeline frictional losses, so therefore they're often not considered in the design process. So we're now going to look at the subject of separation losses at fittings and pipelines. So when a uniform cross-section of a pipe is interrupted by the inclusion of a pipe fitting, for example a valve, a bend, a junction or a flow measurement device, then a pressure loss will occur. The value of these losses is misleading as it's often referred to as minor losses and these have to be included in the pipeline's total resistance to ensure accurate pump and system matching for flow calculations. The term separation loss is used to define pressure losses across such fittings and this describes the physical phenomena which occurs at such obstructions. The flow separates from the pipe wall or the boundary as it passes through the obstruction resulting in the generation of edices or vortices in the flow and consequential pressure loss. This figure shows the flow separating resulting in eddies and consequential pressure losses and you can also see that on the right hand side the typical velocity profiles at the three positions A, B and C. Losses can occur at pipe bends, reducers, pipe junctions and valves. Each may be small but they soon add up on a large pipeline. They can be calculated individually. Sometimes an allowance for energy loss for over an entire pipeline is maybe given a value of say 10%. And this is a bit crude. The losses in pipe fittings are expressed in the form shown here, where k is the fitting loss coefficient, or sometimes referred to as a coefficient of resistance and given the term zeta. k or zeta is a non-dimensional constant and its value is obtained experimentally for any pipe fitting, and it's usually provided by the manufacturer of the fitting or valve. The advantage of expressing losses in the above form is that they can be easily incorporated into the steady flow equation calculations. So flow in a bend is illustrated below. The area of flow separation is shown and this results in an energy loss. As the bend becomes sharper, so does the area of separation become more extensive and the loss coefficient increases. So we can see from the figure that flow around a bend and the separation losses depends on the ratio of the radius of the bend divided by the diameter of the pipe. The figure on the right shows flow separation around a louvre in an airflow control device. Head loss coefficients for a range of fittings are shown in the table on the right. The figure below illustrates various pipe entry conditions. The k values in the table can be explained by reference to the flow separation at the entry to the pipe. So the sharper the entry corner the smaller the vena contractor and the greater the flow separation and the higher the k value. So separation loss coefficients can also be defined in terms of an equivalent length of straight pipe of the same diameter as that including the fitting. This equivalent length of pipe would result in the same frictional loss as that incurred by flow separation through the fitting. So if we consider the darcy weisbach equation where L subscript E is the equivalent length of pipe with a diameter d that would yield a frictional loss equivalent to the particular fitting. So L subscript d equals kd over 4f. So the equivalent length is normally calculated as a number of pipe diameters. The equivalent length may be the equivalent length of a single fitting or the summation of all the separation loss coefficients for a particular system. And the total pressure loss through a pipeline of length L and diameter d can be calculated as shown below. So we're now going to have a look at the Colebrook-White equation and how we apply that to fluid mechanics problems. So the Colebrook-White equation was based upon a joint experiment which Colebrook conducted with Professor White in 1937. Colebrook was a PhD student at Imperial College in London. The experiment was performed with a set of pipes in which the inner side was covered with sand in different grain sizes and one was left without sand and was smooth. The sand was fixed with glue and air was used as the fluid. So the Colebrook-White equation built upon the work of Darcy and Weisbach. They combined the Darcy-Weisbach equation for pressure loss due to friction, including separation losses via the equivalent length model, 
So the cold brick white relationship eliminates the friction factor and arrives at a relationship linking for any given fluid and pipe combination the flow rate to the conduit diameter and pressure loss per unit length. The cold brick white formula can be used to determine the friction coefficient of a turbulent flow. And the formula is used to create diagrams where the friction coefficient can be read. And this type of diagram is known as a Moody diagram. So you can see the colbrook white equation. There are three key elements to this equation. First of all, on the left hand side, we use the Darcy friction factor. And then we have a pipe relative roughness. And then of course, the Reynolds number. So the colbrook white formula is a bit too complex to appeal to engineers. The engineers just want to obtain a rapid solution to the design problems that they face. And these problems usually involve the determination of the pipe size required to handle a certain quantity of liquid at a given friction gradient. What Moody did was he simplified the mathematical procedure by reproducing the transition law curves on a standard lambda Reynolds diagram as shown. The relationship between lambda, the Reynolds number, and k over d can be read directly from the diagram. Another way of designing pipes is using what are called pipe design charts. And these are based on the colbrook white equations. The equation describes the transitional flow between smooth and rough pipes, which covers all commercially available pipes. The charts don't use lambda, but express friction as the height of the roughness of the inside of the pipe. There are different design charts for different types of pipe. And there's a publication by H.R. Wallingford called Tables for the Hydraulic Design of Pipes, Sewers and Channels. And you can get access to this and you can have a look at the information. There's also guidance on how to use these design charts, but don't panic because we'll cover these in the tutorial questions. So let's consider a simple design scenario. We've got a reservoir with a dam and the top water level of the reservoir is position one. We then have an outlet pipe, which is connected through the underneath of the dam. And the outlet of that pipe at position two is 15 meters below the original surface level. So we have some data from that problem. We know the pipe diameter is 200 millimeters and we know the pipe is 2000 meters long. We also know that the outlet is 15 meters below the water level. So the first thing we're going to do is calculate the hydraulic gradient. But note that the hydraulic gradient is expressed in terms of 100 times the hydraulic gradient. So we get a value of 0.75 meters per 100 meters. We then need to locate the intersection of the lines for the hydraulic gradient and the diameter so look at the red and the green lines. At the point at which they intersect, we then draw the discharge line up to the discharge axis. And in this case, we can see it's 45 liters per second, which is 0 0.045 cubic meters per second. You also need to be aware that the chart can be used to determine the diameter of a pipe and head loss for a given discharge. So in the tutorial session, we're gonna look at some uh, practical problems where we're going to apply this theory and we're going to calculate the losses as we cross various fittings in a pipe network. And here you can see a simple example showing a combination of 90 degree elbows, a valve and then a final tap. So we've now got an understanding about how we link energy losses with pipe dimensions. I've explained the darcy weisbach equation and the energy loss depends on the pipe length, the velocity, the diameter, and the friction between the pipe and the flow. We've also talked about what we mean by hydraulic roughness. I explained the experiments of Blasius and Nicarads and how they considered through similar experimental conditions, but didn't realize what they were looking at, which was laminar sublayers. A way of showing energy losses in pipeline is to use what's called the energy hydraulic gradient. I've explained that losses can occur at pipe bends, reducers, pipe junctions and valves, and that these separation loss losses can be expressed as separation loss coefficients, where we use the term k or zeta. I've also shown how you can convert these into an equivalent length of straight pipe. I've introduced the colbrook white formula as well, and shown how you can use a Moody diagram to determine friction loss coefficients, or for example, consider the flow rate in a pipe, given the diameter and the gradient of the pipe. So that's the end of unit six. And what we're gonna look at next is open channel flow.
where we're going to look at the fundamentals, we're going to look at uniform flow and specific energy associated with open channel flow. So now I want you to turn to the tutorial questions and see how you get on with them. So thanks for listening and bye for now.